Hello, everybody, and uh, a very special good morning and a welcome to the close to 300 people that have registered to participate in this, which is the last webinar in 2020 for Business in the Community Ireland. And in very many ways, this is probably the most important uh, event of the year. This event usually takes place in the Mansion House in Dublin, and it's part of our annual CEO forum. Uh, but this year we are here online and it is uh, fantastic that we can have so many more people participating. Why is this a very special event? Well, I'll tell you in a second. First, let me just go through a, a tiny bit of housekeeping. Two very simple things. The first one is that we are recording this event, just so you know. And the second is that uh, this is an event that generates a lot of social media activity. So on the slide, you can see our uh, hashtag BWR mark for those of you who will be active on the world of social. So let me go back to the, to the significance and why I'm so excited to be uh, opening this, this, this session this morning for two very important reasons. The first one is that uh, this morning we're going to recognize a, a group of companies that are certifying or recertifying with the Business Working Responsibly mark. Now, if there's one thing that it's clear from this uh, terrible year of pandemic is that sustainability is commonplace. We know that sustainability is part of your boardroom conversations. We know it's in your C-suite. We know it's in your strategic action plans. But what companies are really looking for are proof points, evidence and objectivity when it comes to talking about sustainability and, and making sure that it's meeting expectations, but that it's also showing continuous improvement. And that is exactly what Business Working Responsibly Mark is about. It's a third party verified um, standard. It's based on what's best in class, ISO 26000, when it comes to defining sustainability. And it's about your policies, your processes, and how you measure and drive impact across more than 20 dimensions. And clearly, the companies that will be uh, you'll be hearing from today will be telling you about their journey. But it's everything from how you engage with your suppliers, how sustainability is part of your product development, what does human rights mean within the context of your business, and how do you uh, ensure that your low carbon net zero journey is real and it's happening. Because that's what we have seen this year. The investors want to hear this, the um, consumers want to see this, and employees are still demanding for companies to be very genuine about their purpose. So that's the first part, very exciting part. And our head of marketing, Maura Horgan, is going to be making the announcement of the companies. And I'm really looking forward to hearing from those companies about that journey. Immediately after uh, Maura makes those presentations and engages with the leaders of those companies, um, our uh, Business Working Responsibly Mark Manager, Maureen O'Donnell, is going to have a intimate dialogue with two of those companies, just to get deep down and understand why do you do this? Why do, are you certifying for the first time? And why are you recertifying subsequently? Everybody's busy but this is really driving change, isn't it? So that's what we're going to see. But before that, and the second big important element of this session is understanding the trends, really knowing what's going to happen going forward. And we're delighted, and I will hand over immediately to um, my uh, colleague and head of advisory services, Bernadette Phelan, who's going to have a very intimate conversation with um, a sustainability trailblazer. There's no other way of defining Mike Barry. Mike has been part of Business in the Community Ireland events for over a decade, and I cannot tell you how excited I am that Mike is here with us this morning. So I would also invite Mike to join the, the virtual stage. I'll leave you in very capable hands, and I'll, uh, I want to, in advance, congratulate everybody and thank you both for this conversation, which I'm really looking forward to hearing. See you later. Thank you. Thank you, Tomas. And good morning, Mike. As Thomas was saying, we've been talking to each other for a decade at this stage. Um, and when you think of that decade, like the strides and the positive changes we've seen in sustainability have been <laughs> phenomenal. You know, if you just think about financial markets and investors, huge changes. But we also know huge challenges ahead. And um, so to get us started, Mike, when you're talking to senior teams, when you're talking to CEOs, how do you describe or how do you characterize what a fit for purpose business is going to look like? You know, what 
is the the essence of a business that'll be able to thrive in a low carbon economy and actually support building social inclusion what, what are your kind of key aspects that you talk about well Brenna, first thank you very much for the kind invitation to join you i mean I, I think the itc island has been right at the heart of bringing businesses together through a period of 10 to 20 years when the signals for change have been a little bit in, in distinct. I think that those signals now are really, really clear. And I think I'm really excited about the next decade that goes ahead. So when I'm in the boardroom, you know, whether it's Mark and Spencer with any of the clients I'm working with now, it comes down to three simple questions. Why do I need to become sustainable? What do I need to commit to do to become sustainable? And crucially, and always forgotten, how do I integrate it into my big, busy business? And I think over the next 15 minutes or so, we'll explore sort of three big trends to do with societal expectation, environmental ambition, and social ambition that touches on those three questions and how any business should respond. Yeah. And I think actually you've touched upon it there in terms of the how. We are very much in that how space at the moment. Um, and we've really got clarity about some of the, the ambitions. But it's really it's really difficult you'll we'll hear from companies that have gone through the business working responsibly mark um later and it's difficult to embed sustainability within your business so what's your approach what, what's your guidance piece in terms of how do you get sustainability at a boardroom level at that strategic level and then operationalize that well Bert, i mean at the very heart of this the how how do i integrate it into my business is having the proper engagement with your customer your suppliers, your investors, the regulators and policy system around you, and crucially, also your competitors and peers in your sector as well. None of us can become low carbon or socially useful on our own. The challenges are just too great. Now, in the past, we've all done a little bit of communication. We've had a bit of broadcast that people said, look, read this CSR report, you know, see this initiative that we've done. And in busy lives, people have sort of glanced at it and then it's gone. Now, when I say about engagement, it is always on 24 seven engagement with people, not just telling them about what you're doing, but explaining why change is necessary okay. and by changing how things can be better, not for the corp not just the corporation, society and the planet, but for the individual as a citizen, as a consumer, as an employee, as an investor, as a neighbor to an organization, they can see those always on benefits of being participating with a more sustainable organization. Um, one of the big pieces we've been seeing, and it's really positive over the last three or four years, are the big statements of ambition, the, the net zero, you know, within Ireland, we have our, our 2030 ambition, you've got the sustainable development goals. So, you know, from both business and government, you're seeing these, these lofty statements. Um, but how do we lock those in? Like when you think of the, the business leaders that are on the call this morning, how or what do we focus on over the next two or three years to actually put us on that trajectory to achieve those necessary ambitions? Like what spaces should we be really focusing on and prioritizing? Well, let me just split the answer into two. There's, there's an environmental answer and there's a social answer. So you're absolutely right. Environmentally, the ambition is written down. Net zero science-based targets to get there. Every organization should have one now, unless there's a really compelling reason. Tell me why you've not got science-based targets. 100% circle on your raw materials, particular plastics in the short term. Again, people like the Ellen MacArthur Foundation have built the networks to enable us to do that. Organizations like Coca-Cola are already using 50% recycled PET in all their plastic bottles, soon be at 100%. The pathway is there. And then when it comes to sustainable raw materials, again, 100% sustainably sourced fish or cotton or wood. We know what we need to do. The great challenge environmentally is having written that ambition down and defined is how do you get there? I and mean, I've just done some work with the British Retail Consortium in the UK. 63 British retailers have come together, even in the middle of COVID, and said, we need to become net zero. Scope one, two, and three. Scope three, 90% of the emissions in that, those huge global supply chains producing tens of billions of individual items every year. Net zero by 2040, 20 years or less now. How do you do it? And what the retailers have done is they've come together and said, there's lots of things that we can compete on and lead the way on ourselves, but there's some really big systemic issues where we need to work together, even as competitors. The first big question, Mark, is heavy goods vehicles, HGVs, the trundle around uh, every nation delivering stuff from factory to warehouse to, to shop to home. How do you decarbonize them? We can decarbonize um, electric cars. We can see the pathway there. 
But when it comes to those big ugly lorries, shifting from diesel to electric or other, other alternatives is hard. So they've all put their hands up and said, we need to work together on that. So my first piece of advice to you is set the ambition, but then join a partnership to drive the change. And it's not just the retailers. I've seen the UK water industry do it. I've seen the National Farmers Union do it on a global scale. I've seen the concrete industry, the steel industry, all coming together and setting joint targets environmentally. So that's environmental. Join the right partnership to deliver those tough goals. Now, socially, I'm really disappointed because I see lots of good individual programs, supermarkets giving food to food banks at, at Christmas, really good diversity inclusion targets to get from an awful place to a slightly better place. But fundamentally, the mindset of business about social sustainability is still compliance. Don't kill somebody on a building site, don't poison somebody with your food, make sure that um, you haven't got kids in your factories on the other side of the world. That's it. So I look at net zero ambition environmentally and think, brilliant, tough to get there, but I know where I'm going. Socially, I'm now looking at things like tax, I'm looking at data, I'm looking at living wage, I'm look looking at sort of um, people, businesses dealing with poverty, and I'm seeing none of that. I want to see ambition from businesses in the next 12, 18 months, post-pandemic, when people are looking at business and saying, society's bailed you out, what are you doing in return? And business hasn't got an answer. So my challenge to all of you on the social is up the game. And when you think of the Irish economy, um, we're, you know, we're exporters, that's what we do. We have a huge um, presence of multinationals. Um, in terms of that, that sectoral piece, any kind of, and actually you've talked a lot there, I think about the sectoral collaboration piece. What, what sectors do you think we obviously need to be focusing on or where are the real opportunities actually? Well, let's start with food right? and farming. I mean, food and farming is the ultimate culprit when it comes to climate change and biodiversity loss and also the ultimate victim. So we're out there spewing out greenhouse gas emissions, whether it's from soil loss, whether it's from a meat-based diet, whether it's from pr production processing, the heavy goods vehicles I've been talking about. All of that drives a really significant global carbon footprint. The food industry and the farming industry needs to put its foot up, hand up and deal with that. But it's also the ultimate victim. I think the, the next decade, food is going to be massively disrupted by weather extremes going forward. So the ability of the, the food and farming industry, not just to respond to society and say we're reducing our emissions, but future proofing itself in terms of resilience is critically important. Now, Ford Beer with um, Origin Green has done that. It's brought together the food and farming industry. It needs to keep stepping on from a very good place. It's got to. It needs to recognise that there's been incremental improvements so far. And that's no criticism. That's just, just where we are but it now needs to lead profound change for the whole brand Irish food and farming for the future as it exports. So food and farming is one I pick out. And also just, I pick out not just in terms of say risk and resilience and being seen to respond, but opportunity. So the future of low carbon is not just about big steel wind turbines out at sea. It's about nature-based nature solutions, making sure that we lock up carbon in well-managed soil, in biodiversity, in tree planting. So to me, there's a massive market opportunity for those Irish food and farming businesses that start to demonstrate, prove that they're doing regenerative agriculture and locking up not just their own carbon, but creating a carbon market to lock up other people's carbon as well. Huge opportunities. Yeah. So food and farming is my number one ask. But then every sector needs to work together because the issues facing the food, the retailers in the UK, only retailers together can solve. You know, I might put an airline, a bank, a pharmaceutical company in the room with them and they have a general discussion about need to act on net zero or carbon pricing. But fundamentally, the issue of HGVs is the one that belongs to the food industry, the retailers, solve it together. Yeah, and I think even just taking that one example of um, agri-food and listening to you there, Mike, you know, two things will be standing out for me. You're kind of articulating that to do low carbon, to be a low carbon economy, it's it's automatically you're talking about circular economy, the move to new products and services. You're talking about nature-based solutions, which Ireland as an industry, we have huge advantages, like we've great engineering, we have great construction. So it's those business opportunities framing, I think is really important. And also listening to you as well, I think for us in an Irish context, the, the agri-food piece also throws up that just transition narrative, you know, how the social dynamics and the trade-offs that we're going to see in terms of creating this low carbon economy and how those debates and discussions are, are completely intertwined and making the, the choices there. Um, but I, I do think it's so important, and you're saying it there, that through that collaboration perspective, that it is about having a really positive vision of 
the future we could create for Ireland. Yeah, and, and just to pick up two words there, just transition is critical. There's a real risk that we think a bunch of technocrats in a boardroom or a, in, in sort of cabinet circles, whether it's in Dublin or the UK and Brussels, think that they can come up with this solution for a low carbon future. And there's a bit of that. We need those big decisions by big people in big rooms. But this has to be democratised. Every person in Ireland has got to see the need for change and the benefits of change. The same across the world. So for, for me, I'm slightly nervous at the moment that we are ploughing along with a technocratic approach to a low carbon future. A small number of people are going to get very rich themselves because they've come up with the right battery solution or the wind turbine solution. Brilliant. Really applaud your entrepreneurial zeal. Do not leave communities behind because we'll get backlashes. We've seen the rise of populism. You know, we've seen it in multiple different marketplaces across the world. If we do not show the benefits of people of shifting from high carbon uh, jobs in farming or in the steel industry or the car industry or the oil industry to an alternative, they'll throw a brick through the window. So I just transitions critical. Yeah. But I really want to finish on this product and service issue because I think this is critical. Amazon's just created some, a point on its website in Europe for 40,000 products that are certified to stead, but be found easily by its customer. Tesco's has just committed to increase its plant-based sales by 300% in five years' time, Unilever by 500%. So all around us, individual businesses are stepping forward and saying, we've gone past the tipping point now. The marketplace for the electric car or the low carbon diet or the um, closed loop clothing, you know, the rise of the resale platforms has come. And I would ask all the audience now not to be complacent because we've had lots of false dawns, lots of sort of cries of wolf in the past that the time was here and consumers really want to change. They really have done now. And bold businesses are already redefining marketplaces utterly around sustainability. And if you're not present in the next 12, 18, 24 months, you're going to get left behind. Just like half the, the world's car industry left at Tesla, diesel addicted five years ago, electric cars would never take off. Now they're all playing catch up and half of them will be gone by 2030. Yeah, it's that disruption mindset. You have to be ready and disrupt yourself as the adage will go. Um, we're quickly running out of time, Mike, which is so dreadful. But if there is one sentiment you'd like to leave the audience with this morning as we face into to 2021, what is that sentiment you'd like to share? Well, let, let's finish off exactly what we've, we, we just said. This is about the products and services you sell. I want you to be thinking about making your operations less impactful. I want you to think about your community programs, all important. But fundamentally, this is the product and service you sell, whether it's business to consumer or business to business. There is a profound realignment of the global economy coming. And you either choose to participate on, in that on the front foot or you'll be forced out of existence either by your investors, by the marketplace, by disruptors emerging, by government taxes, rules and regulations. Mm. This is now consequential. And I want you all to be future proofed and ready. And it's hard in the middle of COVID. I know how hard it's been to run businesses in the last sort of six, seven, eight months. I know that. But you need to use this to re-baseline what you stand for in terms of purpose, the why. You need to repurpose it in terms of your ambition, the what, social and environmental. And fundamentally, I want you to get a grip of the how. How do I engage citizens, customers, suppliers, investors, policymakers and my industry in driving the change that we need urgently? You don't engage. You can have all the best words on a piece of paper in the press release, but you will fail to be there in a decade's time. Good luck and have a great Christmas break when it comes. Thank you so much, Mike, and looking forward to talking in another decade to see what we've actually created. So on that note, I'm going to hand over to Maura. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks a million, Bernadette. I don't know about you, but I could listen to Mike Barry for another hour and just thinking, reflecting that we've had gurus like Mike Barry and Paul Pullman speak at our events in the last month is just incredible. So I've got the sparkles on, as you can see. My name is Moira. I work in business at the Community Ireland, and it is time to announce the companies who have achieved the mark in 2020, the class of 2020, if you will. So first up, we have the six recertifying companies. And I really want to take these few minutes just to acknowledge their achievement. The mark is tough to get. We make it hard on you. But those companies who've achieved it for the second time, and in some places, the third time, they deserve that recognition because it's a real team effort. So first out of the gates is Arup. Huge congratulations to Arup. Huge congratulations to Stephen Fraser and Emer Lynch behind the scenes. Arup have achieved the mark for the second time this year. Next up then we have Fujitsu. 
Congratulations to Tony O'Malley and the fabulous team at Fujitsu, Grace O'Shea and Kathleen Dewan and Carmel and Louise. I know many of you are tuning in today. And an advantage of doing this event virtually rather than in the Mansion House is we have loads of employees actually tuning in today to be recognized for this achievement. As Mike said, you really need to engage your employees on the why behind your sustainability journey. So kudos to all of the teams tuning in today. Then we have, drum roll please, PM Group. Congratulations to Dave Murphy and the team. We're going to hear actually from Katrina from PM Group later on on the panel session about her predictions for 2021 and why standards now really are needed for tendering processes and procurement. Then we have PwC. PwC are achieving the mark for the second time also. They are our wonderful partner on the Low Carbon Pledge. And a big shout out to Stephanie Larkin and Rachel Power in PwC who really drive the mark internally. And then we have RTE. What a year it has been for RTE. Can I just say it's been so essential to have a public broadcaster this year to keep us informed, to educate our children, to entertain us. And a big shout out for the Toy Show Appeal, which raised over 6.4 million euros for charities around the country. And that's powered by our sister organization, the Community Foundation. Kudos to Vivian Flood and Eileen Duggan behind the scenes in RTE for getting the mark for the second time. And last, but by no means least, it is Siemens. Sorry, it is SSC Ireland. Spoiler alert. I'll talk about Siemens later on. I knew the S's would confuse me. Sorry, it is SSE Ireland. A huge shout out to Stephen Wheeler and the team and to the incredible Mia McCarthy, who drives this agenda with many of her colleagues internally in SSE. So that is the companies who have recertified the mark. I think you can guess one of the companies who has just been certified to the mark. But just before I go to announcing those companies, as Mike said, it's really important that you engage employees on this sustainability journey. So we actually asked SSE to ask one of their employees, who I know is tuning in today, Samuel Awe, what does having the mark mean for him as an employee in SSE Ireland? My name is Samuel Awe and I have been working for SSC Airtricity for the last 18 months. It has been a really fulfilling experience working for a company that champions sustainability the way SSC Airtricity does. And I believe the business working responsibly mark validates that. And it also helps the company build on the positive work that they have already been doing. I think SSC has a healthy culture and an attitude towards sustainability and it enables the employees being immersed in that atmosphere incorporate sustainable habits into their daily lives and the bwr mark um is essential it's like an essential cog in the wheel um smoothing along this process thanks so much samuel for making that video congratulations to all of those six research fine companies so now it's time to welcome the new companies who got the mark and I'm going to mix it up because I gave a sneak preview. The first company to achieve the mark for the first time in 2020 is Siemens. And I would love to welcome uh, Fred O'Brien. Fred, if you want to turn on your camera and unmute yourself, I hope this works. He wasn't expecting me to call him first. So maybe Fred isn't there. No sign of Fred at the moment. This is like the Eurovision. I'll come back to Fred because I did land a minute. He was supposed to be last in alphabetical. Oh, there he is. Hi, Hi Fred. Sorry for doing that to you, Fred. <laughs> good morning. Yeah, I'm, I'm still, still struggling with Zoom. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. I mean, I think this has been a, a great journey for us. Siemens has been in swords for for more than 50 years now, and and, and look, we're, we're well embedded in the community and 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 part of of um, you know um, supporting community and and working with community in an intrusive way has been has been a standard way of operating. Um, the whole agenda of sustainability, though, and, and, and the, the wider impact of the business on the community, um, that's become more into sharply into focus in the last, um, the last several years mm. and, and uh, hugely important for us. But, you know, as, as a business, but what's, what's um, I suppose, driving us as much as, as the, the impact on the planet is, is the expectations from employees that they work for a company that, that cares about our planet and that, um, that shares their values. Um, so, so, so um, I know a lot, of them, a lot of those employees would have joined us today, and we're very fortunate to have, have several teams working on sustainability 
and and community projects with us and and uh, maybe i'll take a moment just to thank those um those individuals for the work they do on behalf of the company um, it is hugely important for us so receiving the mark is a is a really nice recognition of that work um, I, I think it's, it's very important. It's a validation of the that we're on the right track, and we do see it as a journey. There's a long way to go yet, but we we do know that um, there is a there is a strong commitment from the company and employees um, that we're going to do whatever we can do to make a contribution. So um, so looking forward to um, to uh, to um, sharing the mark with it with the team, but also to um, to recertification and growing um, as we uh, as we as we learn more and as we contribute more. Thanks so much, Fred. Thanks for doing that. Sorry for surprising you. You can stay That's on okay. screen. <laughs> you can yeah. stay on screen and mute yourself because we'll take a group photograph in a moment. So huge congratulations to Siemens, uh, to Joe O'Reilly. I know listening today, a uh, great powerhouse there in Siemens driving this agenda. Next up we have, drum roll please, it is Caller. Congratulations to Caller Ireland. Duncan, are you there? There he is. Oh, yeah. Hi, oh, yeah. Duncan. Hey, good morning. Uh, <laughs> Congratulations. What does it mean to everybody at Keller? And I know we have loads of people from Keller tuning in today. We do. Oh, we do. I think on behalf of the team, I'm, I'm absolutely thrilled that we're here. Um, we've been a household name in Ireland for over 80 years, and we're fiercely proud of the role that we play with rural communities. The principles we have of health, safety, and integrity, but we also have a care for our people and the environment. They're the, the values that the company is built on. Our ambition is that by 2037, which is going to be our centenary year, all our products will come from renewable sources, and this achieving the business working responsible mark for me is a key step on this path to this renewable future. Overall, yeah, I'd really like to thank all our employees who've been involved, and we've had huge engagement in this topic, um, but also the stakeholders who've supported us on this today. And, and last but no means least, yourselves, the business and the community. It's been a great journey. We couldn't have done it without you, so uh, thank you very much to all of you. Thanks. Thanks so much, Duncan. And we're going to be hearing from your colleague, Catherine Hannan, later on on the panel to talk about what getting the mark for the first time means on your sustainability journey, because as uh, Fred said, it's definitely a journey. Thanks so much, Duncan. You can mute yourself there. Next up, we have Ian Tom from Energia, the third new company to achieve the mark in 2020. Are you there for me, Ian? Oh, this is working out so far. Fingers crossed. Hi, Ian. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Congratulations. Um, Thank you. Uh, we too are absolutely delighted um, to, to join you this morning uh, and with uh, the certification of, uh, of our involvement. Achieving the uh, business working responsibility mark is a really important milestone for us at Energia Group. It's a recognition of our ongoing work in the areas of CSR and sustainability, which are absolutely part of the fabric of what we do. They are cornerstones of our strategy as a leading Irish home and energy business provider and a major renewable energy investor. And renewables play such an important part in underpinning sustainability for the future. At Energy, we supply approximately 25% of the island's total electricity and 21% of the total wind power, meeting the needs of over 800,000 homes and businesses. And last year, we announced our intention to invest over 3 billion euro in Irish renewable energy generation and related systems in the years that come. An investment that's going to benefit the Irish communities, the economy, but also contribute decisively towards decarbonisation and the protection of our domestic and global environment. Awarding the BWRM is a recognition of our ambition, taking a kind of work with communities across Ireland, Ireland in the form of numerous community benefit funds, our support for vulnerable customers, and grassroots partnerships, which are so important. Um, we have, you know, by example, the work we've done with Energy is Get Ireland Growing campaign and Power NI's Brighter Communities Initiative in Northern Ireland, to name but a few. The mark is a recognition of our innovation in business and workplace, our commitment to continuous improvement across staff learning and development, HR governance, and customer service, just to name but a few. This has obviously been a really challenging year for business for all of us. And we're very proud of the energy team all over Ireland and the work that's underpinned the achievement of this morning. And I thank them very, very much for that. And I know a number of them have joined us this morning. Our work is definitely going to continue as we move into the new decade and as we grow and grow in the sustainability 
uh, and responsible in these things. So thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everybody. Thanks so much, Ian, and congratulations to Anita and all the team and everybody tuning in from Energy today. As Ian, and you can mute yourself there, Ian, for me, uh, but do stay on screen. As Ian said, doing a virtual audit in these companies, and there's three more to announce, they got the mark for the first time this year, so they had to do a virtual audit. So a big shout out to our auditing partners, the NSAI, for being able to facilitate that this year. Next up, we have a very busy company. They have had some year keeping us fed. The next company to achieve the mark is Aldi. Uh, Niall O'Connor, the MD, couldn't make it today, though Rachel, the head of sustainability, is going to join us in a second. But Niall sent us this video message. Hi, everybody. Niall O'Connor here, Group Managing Director with Aldi Ireland. At Aldi, we're delighted to achieve the business working responsibly mark. It means a huge amount to all of our employees and suppliers as we all push towards a more sustainable future together. Our CSR and environmental commitments are central to our business strategy, and we understand the importance of working ethically and sustainably at all times. We're working with internal and external stakeholders across a wide variety of sustainability projects, from plastic and packaging targets to carbon emission reductions and reducing food waste in the supply chain. And this is to ensure we align with the UN sustainability goals for 2030. Achieving the mark really validates our work and encourages us to keep going, knowing we're heading in the right direction. From all the team at Aldi, thank you. And big shout out, big congratulations to Aldi and Rachel Nugent, I hope you're there. You're gonna turn on your camera for that group photograph later on. When, there she is. Well done, Rachel. I'm gonna put you on the spot as, the, as, as a woman here, which is great. Anything Morning. you want to say? No, I just said, uh, I think I have my washing machine going on in the background, so it's not ideal timing. I didn't think I was going to be on camera, but no, Aldi are absolutely delighted to achieve the mark. Um, we've been partnered with business in the community since 2018, so it's, um, we're absolutely delighted to achieve it, yeah. Well done, Rachel. I'll leave you go back to your washing. Thanks a million. And we have two more companies to announce. Next up, we have Momentum Support. Huge congratulations to Momentum. Ian, are you there? No, I'm a yes, date, yeah. Good Ian, what does, what does it mean to everybody uh, at Momentum? Well, uh, first of all, I would just like to, to congratulate all the other companies, Moira, uh, on their uh, achievement as well. So well done to everyone. Um, we at Momentum are absolutely delighted at uh, achieving the uh, certification um, as a, a further sort of accreditation to our portfolio, uh, particularly given the timing that we had to go through the assessment because there's been so many challenges out there for everyone this year. Um, we absolutely recognize the importance of future thinking and teams across the whole of our business have played an absolutely pivotal part, not only in the development of the sustainability initiatives, but also by getting involved and playing their part in execu executing them. Um, you know, we cannot help but be so proud. This has been a, a long journey for us and we are extremely proud to get to this stage and I'm extremely thankful um, to all of the team for their support with that. Um, at Momentum Support, we have always had a strong culture of playing our part in supporting others uh, through our business practices. And we, we believe that this achievement both validates and really underpins that. Um, and we will absolutely support us in taking our efforts to the next level as leaders within our particular business sector. Thanks, Ian. And congratulations to Verona, I know, in Momentum, who drove this. And last, but by no means least, the sixth company to achieve the mark for the first time in 2020 is... There he is, Permanent TSB. It's Eamon Crowley, the CEO of Permanent TSB. Congratulations, Eamon. How are you? Very well, Moira. And uh, firstly, let me start by congratulating other member companies who've certified and recertified today. We are absolutely honoured to be in such great company uh, with, with the, with the uh, colleagues here. Uh, and as I listen to them, I, I'm enthused by the, uh, the change we can see happening. Uh, and indeed, the engagement earlier on was fantastic. You know, I'd like to say thank you to my own team here in the bank who've worked really hard to get us to this stage and to you all in business in the community of Ireland for the support that you've given us over the last number of years that, have, that has enabled us to be here today with you all. We've made significant progress in our responsible business strategy since 2016. And again, it's an, a large thank you to lots of people who've got us to this stage. Our purpose as an organisation is around building trust with what our customers with, with the communities we operate in and wider society and achieving 
uh, the, the business working with Sponsor Mark is a real demonstration of that purpose and action for us. And it's a reflection of the progress that we're making in evolving our culture for the better of customers, colleagues, and communities. We're really proud to, to have achieved this accreditation. And I believe we are committed, and, and not only by way of words, but by way of action in, in doing more in this area. So with the focus on long-term sustainability and recognize the important role that business can play in tackling key issues, we are committed to evolving a responsible and sustainable business strategy in the years that lie ahead. So thank you to all, and it's fantastic to be here with you. So great. Eamon, thanks so much, and congratulations to Courtney Kyle. I know in permanent TSB is a powerhouse there who drove that forward. We're, I'm just going to stay quiet for three seconds because we're going to take a screen grab behind the scenes. So we can all smile so the camera no eyes closed. And I hope we got that photograph. I will leave you go. Congratulations to the six new companies, to the six recertifying companies, the class of 2020. Mike Barry put it up to us, and indeed Paul Pullman did too. It takes leadership. It takes all of your leadership. This is a journey, as Fred said. You know, the mark is a great foundation tool for you, a great management process. And we really, really need to raise the ambition for sustainability in the country, but it's a great way to start. And 40 companies in Ireland now have this standard. So congratulations to all of you. That was like the Oscars. Um, you can all turn off your cameras. You can all relax and enjoy our panel session, which is led by my fantastic colleague, Maureen O'Donnell. Maureen, are you there? She's going to turn on her camera. There she is. Maureen, over to you for our panel session. I'll leave it in your capable hands. Take care. Okay. Thanks so much, Moira. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, if I could ask my fellow uh, panelists here to join the stage, Katrina Fitzsimons from PM Group and Catherine Hannon from Keller. You're good very morning. welcome. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> so, so, uh, and congratulations to all of the companies that certified and recertified this year. It was just so wonderful to see them all um, recognized in this way. Uh, so, Katrina, um, if, if I could start with you in, in terms of the panel here. Um, PM Group, are, they're architects, they're engineers, your project managers. Um, you heard Mike Berry describe the rising urgency uh, and priority of CSR. Um, that agenda as a whole for business and, and how particularly the customer voice is critical. So what challenges are out there for PM Group and, and what actions are you taking to respond to them? Hi, Maureen. Good morning. And yes, uh, I guess Mike's, um, you know, listening to Mike there was, was absolutely fascinating. And um, there's, there's no doubt there are many challenges ahead for, for all our businesses and society in general, I guess. Um, but I also believe, and, and Mike said it as well, and Bernadette, there has been a sort of seismic shift, I think, in the last five years in terms of businesses understanding of those responsibilities. Um, I guess for us, the key external challenge facing our business is to design and deliver really large, complex facilities with as low a carbon footprint as possible. But, you know, not only do we want to deliver sustainable design, we want to you know, offer our clients human centric design. That is, uh, you know, a workplace that will nourish and inspire their employees. That's a, an increasing demand as well for us. Um, and, you know, our clients also want facilities that will contribute to the local communities long term and cause minimum disruption during construction. And we all want to do that in with lots of innovation, be time cost effective. We all want it delivered by diverse, highly skilled and motivated teams. So, you know, that's our challenge and it's an opportunity too, if you look at it that way, but it's to bring all those asks to every proposal, to every design solution, to every project plan. And even if the client didn't ask for it, that you know we're offering it up there first time, every time. Um, I suppose it not only requires everyone in the business that at every level trained in how they can do their job with that sustainability responsibility lens on it, but also really believing that it's the right thing to do. And that comes back, I guess, to having your, your vision, vision, your mission, your values all lined up. Um, you know, I suppose a, a practical example of, of that would be where we would build in sustainability reviews into key stages of our project life cycle, um, just simply making a part of how we run our projects. So, you know, whether you're an architect or you work in procurement, you should know what's required to deliver sustainable solutions that there are checkpoints put in place to make sure you're doing it. Um, 
and you know, I guess as Mike said earlier as well, and Bernadette, you know, there's we're at that juncture where the boards and the senior leadership get this now it's embedded in in strategies for the most part but the challenge is to embed it into every business process get it into everybody's psyche um, and that requires a lot of communication training kpis across all the business and basically to ma making it everybody's agenda and that to me i guess is is the challenge maureen yeah, that is a challenge, um, particularly, I mean, what you're talking about really, I suppose, in some respects is culture change. Um, and there's there's sort of a process that you can follow for culture change, but there's a, there's a heart component of it as well, I think, that, that can be a bit tricky. Hearts and help. minds. Hearts and minds, yeah. Hearts and minds, exactly. And it, it does help, I suppose, that sustainability is, as you mentioned, rising in the agenda, that there are priorities that are out there by your customers and et cetera. Um, but still, uh, it, it's, it's definitely uh, a journey. And, and Catherine, if, if you want to weigh in here, um, Catherine, Caller is a household name. As, as Duncan said, you've been supplying fuel uh, to rural communities for more than 80 years. But it's interesting because now, you know, as, as Mike mentioned, um, there's these carbon neutrality targets out there. So the Irish government set a carbon neutrality goal for 2050. And that's fundamentally going to change your business, as, as Duncan talked about, um, which I think is really interesting. So what, what actions is Caller taking to respond to this massive seismic shift uh, in, in the world? Thanks, Maureen. Um, delighted to participate. Um, Yes, yeah, so there's a lot of change um, in the external landscape right now, in particular from, a, as you said, from a policy perspective. So if we look at the, the European Green Deal um, that has been set out, and then if we look at Ireland's um, ambitious targets around the, the, the new climate action plan, um, and the government is setting out, you know, great ambition on reducing, you know, as a nation, our carbon emissions by 7% on average every year. Um, and also driving, you know, the decarbonisation of a number of sectors. So if you look at just how Ireland is performing to date, you know, we seem to have made a lot of good progress in, on renewable electricity in particular, but, but there are two key sectors that are still challenging for Ireland, and that is renewable heat and renewable transport. So although they're challenging, they are also opportunities, and that's a space that Caller is working in and that we can really make a difference um, you mentioned, Maureen, that, you know, we operate in rural Ireland, so not many people know, but about 39% of homes in Ireland are not connected to the natural gas grid. Um, those homes, you know, have challenges then around energy choice. You know, what, what energy do they choose? How do they play a role in the energy transition? How can we mobilize them? How can we support them? So Caller, as you mentioned, has been supplying lower carbon liquefied gas to the homes that are not connected to the grid and also to many businesses around Ireland for over 80 years. So, you know, if you, if you look at the policy landscape and you look at the future, we have, you know, looked at our business and made a commitment to, to lowering our carbon emissions and to focusing on air quality in particular as two key environmental um, goals for our company. Um, when you set out ambition and goals, you know, that leads to a lot of innovation. So, we have looked at our, our, our strategy um, we have committed to, to transitioning to renewable energy, as Duncan said, by 2037. But we have also set out an ambition to reduce our own carbon emissions by 25% by 2025. So it's very important to, to identify the metrics and the goals and then that drives innovation. So one key milestone for our business in 2018 is that we introduced um, bio LPG, which is a renewable gas to off-grid homes and businesses. So that was a really, you know, in terms of disruptions or key milestones, that was a, a momentous milestone for Caller as a business. So it means that we are, you know, helping and supporting rural businesses and rural homes to make the transition from, you know, higher carbon fuels. Just one other thing to mention is, and, and I resonated with what Mike mentioned earlier, was just the, the just transition. So if you look at rural homeowners, you know, how can we bring them along this journey, but also ensure that that transition is just and fair. So today in Ireland, you know, a lot of rural homes, for example, are still using solid fuels. Um, about 65% of households in rural Ireland are using oil. So in terms of Caller and what we're doing in rural Ireland is we're helping those homes to transition 
to liquefied gas and to you know start reducing their carbon emissions but also addressing air quality which is becoming a you know huge challenge for Ireland and then by by introducing bio LPG we're providing them with a seamless transition to a renewable gas um in, in the short to medium term so there are exciting things happening um and just to give you a, a flavor of, of where we are in this space yeah and and what's interesting to me i think you know mike was talking earlier about uh everybody's we, we've got a clear path on the environmental side of things but when you're talking about yeah. the social si side of things it tends to be still compliance focused and you know so so i love the idea of the just transition and really providing these sort of affordable uh and environmentally conscious solutions for everyone in ireland uh, so so that's that's a great mission and and so a congratulations on receiving the mark that's that's something that i didn't want to forget to say this is your first time through so uh it, it's a bit of a journey i know um it, how does the mark certification that you have um the the work that you have done right how how has that supported this agenda that you just outlined and if you can give me just a couple of key next steps in that uh, that would be great um I think, Maureen, it was, you know, when we set out an ambitious, you know, um, strategy and, you know, when, when somebody mentions, you know, sustainability and sustainability is at the heart of Catter's business strategy. And I think we were talking over the last couple of days with Katrina, you know, it's well, what does that mean? You know, that they're, they're just words. What does that actually mean? So really, our commitment then was to ensure that we developed and built the governance structures around that commitment. So really, you know, for us, the value of partnering with business in the community gave us the space to actually look at our entire business. So not just the environmental commitments that we've made and that really valuable contribution we can make, you know, in terms of the energy transition and bring rural consumers with us. But we also wanted to look at, you know, what does, what does all of this mean to our employees, our customers, our supply chain? How can we make an impact across all of those areas? So what was very important for us was to to get a baseline. So, so I mean, one thing that the business and community helped us with was to come in and actually assess where were we um, and where do we need to go in all of these key areas. So one big thing we learned is that, you know, sustainability is not just about the environment. It is about your employees. It is about how you're engaging your customers. You know, how are you, you know, promoting your responsible products and services? How can you make an impact in your supply chain, for example? So one, one thing that we, we are really driving hard is we are monitoring and we are reporting and collecting our scope one, two and three emissions, for example. And, you know, as Mike said, companies are well aware we can do a lot in terms of scope one and two, which are our own, you know, energy management, you know, you know, the fuels that we use, how we can reduce consumption. But we all know that the biggest impact we can, we can make is, is through the supply chain and it's through our consumers and the fuels that they use. So we very much focus on, you know, how, what's the impact we can make in particular on scope three. And that is about the innovation piece. So providing product innovation, allowing our customers to transition from heavier carbon fuels to lower carbon and ultimately renewable energy. Um, but it's also about embedding, you know, core practices within our supply chain. You know, our procurement colleagues developed a supplier code of conduct and um, a modern slavery statement. So it's setting out, you know, what are our values and what impact can we make across those core areas? So once again, I suppose kind of that idea of embedding this within your whole organization um, and, and doing that through structures, but then also capturing the heart uh, of, of what you're doing, which I love the fact that you say sustainability is at the heart of your strategy, because to me that sets the, the emotional tone and then everything else can just kind of follow along, you know, with that, the structures you put in place. Absolutely. Um, Katrina, back back to you. You described the internal transformation earlier um, that that's going to have to occur now to serve those new customer priorities. Um, that that everyone has to think it's the right thing to do, right? Um, that'd be difficult in a normal year. But as several people have mentioned, 2020 has been massively disruptive. Um, priorities have shifted dramatically, um, rapidly. Who knows what's going to happen in 2021? Um, so, so Mike talked about the opportunities around building resilience, which really resonated with me. How does focusing more deeply on the agenda for you build resilience into PM Group? 
Yeah, Maureen, it's it's a really interesting, I suppose, question in in terms of resilience. You know, because shifting priorities are, are always a, a challenge for any business, and you know, in perhaps I suppose in the past, corporate responsibility was something that was a bit over there on the shelf, nice to have, and you know, if things got a bit tough, it, you know, it wasn't, it it could get dropped. But I guess it, you know, back to kind of Catherine's point, and and as well about embedding it really into your business, into your processes, you know, into every department, then you know, it won't get left on the shelf if things get a bit tough. And, you know, during 2019, we um, we did something where we matched each of our executive leadership team to an area of corporate responsibility for them to champion and support. Um, and so that makes it very real and, and very tangible. And it proved a real dial changer for us in term of, terms of moving objectives for, forward faster and embedding them into key parts of the business. But I suppose, you know, when you talk about disruption and obviously COVID being the, the massive disruptor of, of, of this year, you know, climate change is, is much more than that. It's possibly the biggest challenge we'll all ever face and there's no vaccine for it. So the business, as Mike said, you know, the businesses that don't focus deeply on it will not survive um, as most of our stakeholders now are demanding to see and, and hear our actions. So, you know, that's that's obviously the key challenge and there's a huge amount of conversation about it but then again as as, as Catherine said you know there's 17 UN SDGs for a reason we can't all just focus on on the one that is climate change there's another 16 um, that mustn't get left behind um, things like diversity and inclusion like community support like the just transition you know they all need to be stitched in to our business strategies and into our KPIs so that they too become part of the DNA of the organization and that way we're resilient if and when a new challenge does arise um, you know even on the on the topic of diversity and inclusion we ourselves have had to do quite a bit of work on that we're in a very male dominated sector certain disciplines would only have 15 to 20 percent of females entering college um, so you know to turn the dial on that requires real investment right down to sort of primary school level um, we're heavily invested in, in education programs across all our international business units because a good supply of stem graduates is going to ensure our pipeline of talent for the, for the future and make us more resilient um, We've partnered with a number of disadvantaged schools um, close to our offices in Ireland with long term bursaries and um, promoting STEM. And we want to continue those partnerships, even in when those kids go on into college by mentoring them in their STEM courses. So I suppose that sort of, you know, long term planning and involvement um, helps build that resilience for the key things that you need as a business going forward. But of course, we can't we can't fix everything, you know, and we have to focus on our biggest impacts and we have to then spread that responsibility across the business and work with other organizations so that we can, you know, achieve a lot more and be more resilient for the future as a, as a sector and as businesses generally. Yeah. And, and what strikes me about what you said, which first off, I just absolutely love the, the point that there is no vaccine for climate change. There is no vaccine for climate change. It, it just is yeah. such a powerful statement. Um, it, the thing that strikes me about what you said, and, and also what Catherine has said, is that you're, you're planning over a much longer time horizon. You know, you're, you're looking out to 2050 and, and 24, you're investing in primary schools so that you can have a, a better gender balance in your workforce and more diversity in your workforce, not two years from now, not five years from now, but 10, 15, 20 years down the, the line. Um, that, that's an incredibly powerful statement and I think a, a significant investment. Um, okay, 30 seconds, we've got 30 seconds. One one more quick question for you both. Uh, it, so, so a couple of key takeaways. If you could give the audience one tip, okay, one tip in terms of improving or getting certified or whatever, whatever you want to give them that one tip around improving, what would it be? Uh, Katrina, you go first. 
Uh, for me, I think it is don't be an island. This came up a couple of times already today. You know, we cannot do this alone. We can't do any of it alone. Um, I think there's there's real engagement out there on all the sustainability, corporate responsibility topics. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's in the most unlikely places. I would say bring as many people on the journey with you. Find champions and advocates in your company. Mm -hmm. Partner with other businesses and community organizations. Get help from people like business in the community you know that way we're, we're not only changing our business we're potentially changing all the people that our people interact with you know when they go home and they talk about diversity or they talk about what you know recycling or whatever it is they're yeah. changing their children and their partners and their community so it can be a really powerful thing yeah. Um, yeah. to bring as many people on the journey with you so so bring folks along in the journey. That's a really powerful statement. Thank you. Catherine, uh, 30 seconds, last word, key takeaway. Echo a couple of messages that Katrina made, which is, again, I would say put sustainability, if you're serious about it, put it at the heart of your strategy and you know the required governance around it and the metrics and the KPIs and continue to measure and to implement continuous improvement. That's what we've learned from our partnership with business and the community. But the other big one in terms of hearts and minds is that sustainability has to be inclusive, not exclusive. Yeah. It's not yeah. someone pointing to an office in an organization saying that person owns sustainability. A color, everybody owns sustainability. Everybody has a role to play because if everybody owns it, then everybody has a responsibility. So make it inclusive, not exclusive would be the key message particularly during these divisive times. You, you have to focus on inclusion, absolutely, yes. Oh, well stated, both of you, Katrina, Catherine, thank you both so much. Again, congratulations, Katrina, on your recertification, Catherine, you. on your first time through the MARC journey, uh, and, and I look forward to working with you in the future. Thomas, uh, I think we're back to you. Thanks so much, uh, Maureen, and thanks for um, facilitating such a fascinating conversation. So it's time to bring this event to, to a close. Um, it is exciting uh, for business in the community that in the year of our uh, 20th anniversary, more than 40 companies achieved the business working responsibly mark. That is a, a significant milestone. And, um, and you can see there in, 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 on your screens the, the, the 40 companies that have taken this journey and that are demonstrating that this is very much more than just uh, stated intentions. This is about a management system and this is about uh, setting the right foundations for sustainability to be an integral part of the, of the business. Um, as, as, as Mike quoted earlier, and um, uh, he, was, he, he was definitely talking about products and services and that's where, where, where sustainability needs to be, to be seen. And, um, and, and the other thing I want to say about this, this group of companies is that they are helping us drive the next generation of the work of business in the community, which is really exciting. And you will hearing much more about that um, next year. Second thing I would like to say is to acknowledge again, uh, Mike Barry and, and his insights, uh, judging by the amount of times that he was quoted the, over the last hour, it, certainly it has been um, fundamental to have somebody like him. And as Bernadette said, we look forward to seeing him again uh, in, in, in a few years time. The last thing I want to do is to uh, let you know that in a few minutes, uh, our member companies will be staying online uh, for a private member meeting. And that's another uh, way in which we're going to close the, our, our, our very significant volume of work uh, with our members. But I do want to leave one particular date in your diary, and that is uh, 6th October 2021. Um, as, I, as, as I mentioned before, this is our 20th anniversary. We wanted to celebrate it in style. COVID didn't allow it to happen, but it will happen next year. So I sincerely hope you will be able to join us. And I want to thank in advance the companies that are coming together as um, supporters and sponsors of, 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 the, of the conference. For our members, just to let you know, there's a separate link. So we'll be joining the, 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 the private member session through, through a separate link. But once again, I want to give some final thank yous. Firstly, to, to Mike. Uh, secondly, to the companies that have uh, recertified, the companies that have certified, to the leaders, to those of you who are making the work happen. And from the side of business in the community, to, to my colleagues. 
the Business Work and Responsibility Mark team, which is led by Maureen O'Donnell, but also supported by Samira Mushimi, Natalia Carvalho, and Joe O'Donnell. You're an exceptional group of colleagues and I'm very grateful. And obviously to our, 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 our team's uh, manager, Lorraine Wall, that makes it all this happen. It's time to say goodbye. Have a fantastic uh, end of year. Happy Christmas and looking forward to much more work around sustainability in 2021. Goodbye.